Nelson Mandela is considered to be one of the greatest leaders of the world, who freed South Africa from British slavery forever by running an organized movement free of violence, who ruled South Africa for almost 345 years, but due to a brave and loyal leader, the destiny of South Africa changed forever. That he prepared himself for this for 27 years and for 27 years he played this role by reading which books in prison and being inspired. You can get an idea of all these things in the first speech that Mandela gave immediately after his release. In the period of youth, the history of freedom is included when people were with him, the mental slaves sentenced him to 27 years and left him in prison. The jailer of the prison calls Mandela every day and says that it was better than this, he would get the death penalty, it was such a dangerous punishment. How Mandela quietly continued his movement while in prison and inspired his generation to education. What caused him to fall out with his wife and why did he leave her and what famous phrase did he say afterwards that will live on in the hearts and minds of people for the rest of the world. The time has come for Mandela to say goodbye to this world of mine and yours. Why is mourning celebrated for three days? Let's try to know. Who was this Mandela in which he freed the people of his country from slavery forever and ever? Early Life Childhood, 1918-1934 Mandela was born on July 18, 1918, in the village of Mviso, which was part of South Africa's Cape Province at the time. His given name, Ralilala, which translates to troublemaker in Kosa, was later changed to Madiba, his clan name. His great-grandfather, Ngubenkyuka, led the Themba Kingdom in the Transkian territories of South Africa's current Eastern Cape Province. Ngubenkyuka's son, Mandela, became Nelson Mandela's grandfather and the origin of his surname. As Mandela was the son of a king's wife from the Exiba clan, left hand house, his descendants were considered morganatic, meaning they were not eligible to inherit the throne but were recognized as hereditary royal advisors. Nelson Mandela's father, Gadla Henry Mfakaniiswa Mandela, 1880-1928, served as a local chief and counselor to the monarch. He was appointed to this role in 1915 following his predecessor's corruption scandal by a white magistrate. In 1926, Gadla was dismissed for corruption but Mandela was told that his father had lost his position due to his resistance against the magistrate's excessive demands. Gadla was a follower of the god Kamada and was married to four wives, had four sons, and nine daughters, who lived in various villages. Mandela's mother, Nosakini Fanny, was Gadla's third wife and the daughter of Nketima from the Right Hand House, a clan of the Kosa. Mandela later mentioned that his early years were deeply influenced by traditional Kosa customs and taboos. He grew up with two sisters in his mother's crawl in the village of Kunu, where he spent a lot of time with other boys, taking care of the cattle. Both his parents were unable to read or write, but his mother, who was a devout Christian, sent him to a local Methodist school at around seven years old. Baptized into the Methodist faith, Mandela was given the English name Nelson by his teacher. At about nine, his father came to live with them at Kunu, where he passed away from an unknown illness Mandela believed to be lung disease. Feeling cut adrift, Mandela later described his father's proud rebelliousness and stubborn sense of fairness as traits he inherited. Mandela's mother took him to the Great Place Palace at Nkekazwini, where he was placed under the care of the Themba regent, Chief John Jintaba Dalangibo. Although Mandela did not see his mother again for several years, he felt a deep connection with John Jintaba and his wife, treating him as if he were their own child. As Mandela attended church services every Sunday with his guardians, Christianity became a significant part of his life. He went to a Methodist mission school near the palace, where he learned English, Kosa, history, and geography. He developed a passion for African history, listening to the stories of the elderly visitors to the palace, and was inspired by the anti-imperialist views of a visiting chief, Joy. However, at that time, the European settlers were viewed by him and others as helpers rather than oppressors, as they introduced education and other advantages to southern Africa. At the age of 16, Mandela, along with Justice and several other boys, 
journeyed to Taihalara to participate in the Owoluko circumcision ceremony, which signified their change from boys to men. Following this, he was named Dalabunga. Being a chief was a significant role in the local community, offering a feeling of importance and duty. His removal from this position in 1926 had a profound impact on young Nelson Mandela's understanding of justice and authority. The practice of polygamy was common in their culture, and the extended family system fostered a deep sense of community and collective responsibility. The village of Kunu, where Mandela spent his early years, was a small, rural area where traditional Kosa ways of life were dominant. Here, he absorbed Kosa culture and traditions, which greatly shaped his worldview. His schooling at the Methodist institution played a crucial role in his early intellectual growth. The introduction to a Western-style education and Christianity opened up new perspectives and possibilities for him. The choice of his teacher to give him the English name Nelson was a reflection of the colonial influence on education. The death of his father was a turning point in his life, leading him to Mkekezwini, where he was exposed to a wider range of political ideas and leadership concepts under Chief John Jantaba's care. During his time at Mkekezwini, Mandela's interactions with notable individuals and his exposure to narratives of African history and resistance to imperialism laid the groundwork for his future involvement in political activism. The Owoluko circumcision ceremony was a key cultural event, marking his transition into adulthood and reinforcing a sense of identity and responsibility. Clark Berry, Held Town, and Fort Hare, 1934-1940 in pursuit of the necessary abilities to secure a position as a privy counselor within the Themba royal family, Mandela embarked on his secondary education in 1933 at Clarkberry Methodist High School in Nkobo. This institution, known for its Western-influenced approach, stood as the largest educational facility for black African students in Thembuland. Here, Mandela engaged with his peers on an equal footing, claiming that he discarded his pretentious demeanor, formed a close bond with a female classmate, started participating in sports, and cultivated a deep passion for gardening. He finished his junior certificate in just two years. In 1937, Mandela relocated to Helltown, the Methodist College in Fort Beaufort, the educational and social hub for the Themba royal family, including justice. The principal of the college highlighted the superiority of European culture and governance, yet Mandela's interest in indigenous African traditions grew. He formed a friendship with a non-Kosa individual who spoke Sotho, and was inspired by one of his favorite instructors, an Kosa who defied societal norms by marrying a Sotho. Mandela spent a significant amount of his free time at Helltown engaging in long-distance running and boxing, and by his second year, he had taken on the role of a prefect. With the support of John Jintaba, Mandela began his undergraduate studies at the University of Fort Hare in 1939, a prestigious institution for African students with around 150 students located in Alice, Eastern Cape. His academic pursuits included English, anthropology, politics, native administration, and Roman Dutch law, with the goal of securing a position as an interpreter or clerk within the Native Affairs Department. He resided in the Wesley House dormitory, where he formed close relationships with his relative K. D. Matanzama and Oliver Tambo, who would become his lifelong friend and ally. He also took up ballroom dancing, starred in a drama society play about Abraham Lincoln, and conducted Bible study sessions within the local community as a member of the Student Christian Association. Despite having acquaintances affiliated with the African National Congress ANC, who advocated for South Africa's independence from British rule, Mandela steered clear of the emerging movement. Instead, he became a staunch advocate for the British war effort during the Second World War. By the conclusion of his first year, he became embroiled in a dispute with the Students' Representative Council SRC, over the quality of the food, which led to his suspension from the university. He never returned to complete his undergraduate studies. Arriving in Johannesburg, 1941 to 1943. In December 1940, Mandela returned to Mkekezwini and found out that John Jantaba had arranged marriages for him and justice. Dissatisfied with this arrangement, they escaped to Johannesburg through Queenstown, arriving in April 1941. Mandela began working as a night watchman at Crown Mines, which was his initial exposure to the workings of South African capitalism. However, 
He was quickly dismissed when the headman of the community, the Induna, discovered his fugitive status. He then stayed with a relative in George Gotch Township, where he met Walter Sisulu, a real estate agent and ANC activist. Sisulu helped Mandela secure a position as an articled clerk at the law firm of Witkin, Seidelsky, and Eidelman, managed by Lazar Seidelsky, a progressive Jewish man who supported the ANC's objectives. At the firm, Mandela formed friendships with Gaur Radebe, a member of the Hlubi ANC and Communist Party, and Nat Bregman, a Jewish communist who was his initial white friend. Mandela attended Communist Party meetings and was impressed by the sense of equality among people of different races, including Europeans, Africans, Indians, and coloreds. However, he chose not to join the party due to its atheism, which conflicted with his Christian beliefs, and he saw the struggle against apartheid as a racial issue rather than a class struggle. To further his education, Mandela took a University of South Africa correspondence course while working on his bachelor's degree at night. Despite the challenges of poverty, crime, and pollution in Alexandra Township, it remained a place he cherished. Although he was self-conscious about his financial situation, he briefly dated a Swazi woman and tried to court his landlord's daughter, though these attempts were unsuccessful. To save money and be closer to the city center, Mandela moved into the living quarters of the Witwatersrand Native Labor Association, where he lived with miners from various tribes. During this period, he had the opportunity to meet the Queen Regent of Basutoland when she visited the area. By late 1941, John Jantaba came back to Johannesburg and forgave Mandela for his desertion. John Jantaba went back to Thembuland, where he passed away in the winter of 1942. After successfully completing his bachelor's degree in early 1943, Mandela returned to Johannesburg. Opting for a career in law, he decided against seeking the position of privy councillor in Thembuland. Revolutionary Activity and Imprisonment Law Studies and the ANC Youth League, 1943-1949 Mandela started his legal education at the University of the Witwatersrand, where he was the sole African-African student and encountered intense racism. Despite these challenges, he formed bonds with students from various political backgrounds, including liberals, communists, Jews, and Indians, among them Joe Slovo and Ruth First. As his political views became more pronounced, Mandela took part in a successful bus strike in August 1943, protesting against fair hikes. After joining the African National Congress ANC, Mandela was greatly influenced by Walter Sisulu, often visiting his home in Orlando and engaging with activists like his longtime friend Oliver Tambo. In 1943, Mandela met Anton Lambide, an ANC member who advocated for the Africanist approach to African nationalism, which opposed forming racially inclusive alliances and working with communists. Despite his friendships with people from different races and political ideologies, Mandela was drawn to Lambide's stance on African self-rule. Realizing the importance of a youth organization to rally Africans against oppression, Mandela was part of a group that suggested this to ANC President Alfred Bidainishima. This led to the establishment of the African National Congress Youth League ANCYL, on Easter Sunday 1944, with Lambide at the helm and Mandela on the board. At Walter Sisulu's residence, Mandela met Evelyn Mays, a nursing trainee and ANC activist from Nkobo, Transke. They began a romantic relationship and got married in October 1944, initially living with her family before settling in a rented home in Orlando in early 1946. Their first child, Mediba Thembai Thembakile, was born in February 1945. A daughter, Mikazue, passed away tragically from meningitis nine months later. Mandela valued family life, inviting his mother and sister, Libby, to live with him. In early 1947, Mandela completed his legal training at Witkin, Seidelsky, and Eidelman, choosing to dedicate himself fully to his studies with financial support from the Bantu Welfare Trust. In July 1947, Mandela hurried Lambid to the hospital where he died. Peter MDA, who took over as ANCYL president after Lambid's death, was more moderate and open to working with communists and people from other races, making Mandela the ANCYL secretary. 
However, Mandela disagreed with MDA's strategy and supported a failed attempt to remove communists from the ANCYL in December 1947, believing their ideology was not truly African. In the same year, Mandela was appointed to the leadership team of the ANC's Transvaal Province Section, working under the leadership of regional head C.S. Ramahano. However, when Ramahano went against the team's decisions by forming alliances with Indians and communists, Mandela played a key role in his ouster. During the 1948 South African national election, which was restricted to white voters, the party led by Afrikaner dominance. The Haranig Nationali party under Daniel Francois Malin, secured victory, eventually evolving into the national party. This party enforced apartheid through new laws, broadening racial separation. As Mandela and his allies within the ANC grew in power, they started pushing for direct confrontations against apartheid, drawing inspiration from the strategies employed by the Indian community in South Africa. Facing opposition to these actions, Shima was ousted by James Maroka, who led a more aggressive executive committee, including figures like Sisulu, MDA, Tambo, and Godfrey Pitch. Mandela observed that this shift had led the ANC towards a more radical and revolutionary direction. Committed to his political career, Mandela was unable to pass his final year at Witwatersrand on three occasions, ultimately being denied his degree in December 1949. Defiance Campaign and Transvaal ANC Presidency, 1950-1954 In March 1950, Nelson Mandela became a member of the ANC's national executive and later that year took on the role of national president for the ANCYL. At this time, the Defend Free Speech Convention took place in Johannesburg, bringing together activists from Africa, India, and the communist movement to demand a May Day general strike against apartheid and the rule of the white minority. Despite Mandela's reservations about the strike due to its diverse nature and the absence of ANC leadership, it went ahead with a significant number of black workers participating. This led to increased police crackdowns and the enactment of the Suppression of Communism Act, 1950. At the ANC National Conference in December 1951, Mandela's stance against a united front of races was overridden, leading him to shift from supporting Lembede's Africanism to backing a coalition of races against apartheid. Influenced by friends like Moses Kotain and the Soviet Union's backing for liberation movements, Mandela's initial distrust of communism began to wane. He began to study the works of Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and Mao Zedong, eventually adopting the Marxist ideology of dialectical materialism. Mandela later noted his attraction to the concept of a society without classes, which he found reminiscent of traditional African communal life. In April 1952, Mandela began employment at the H.M. Bassner law firm, owned by a communist. His growing commitment to activism, however, meant he spent less time with his family. The ANC, in collaboration with Indian and communist groups, planned a defiance campaign against apartheid, setting up a national voluntary board to recruit volunteers. Motivated by Mahatma Gandhi's non-violent resistance, the campaign aimed to rally large-scale protests. While some saw this approach as morally sound, Mandela saw it as a strategic move. At a Durban rally on June 22, he addressed a crowd of 10,000, kickstarting the campaign's protests, which led to his arrest and brief detention in Marshall Square Prison. These incidents cemented Mandela's status as a prominent black political figure in South Africa. The campaign resulted in a dramatic increase in ANC membership from 20,000 to 100,000, prompting the government to launch widespread arrests and pass the Public Safety Act, 1953, which permitted martial law. Following J. B. Mark's ban from public appearances, he recommended Mandela as his successor. Despite opposition from those who favored Africanism, Mandela was elected regional president in October. In July 1952, Mandela was arrested under the Suppression of Communism Act and stood trial with Maroka, Sisulu, and Yusuf Dedu in Johannesburg. Convicted of statutory communism, a term the government used to describe opposition to apartheid, their sentence of nine months hard labor was suspended for two years. In December, Mandela was issued a six-month ban on attending meetings or speaking to more than one person at a time, rendering his position as Transvaal ANC president untenable. During this time, 
the Defiance campaign lost its momentum. In September 1953, Andrew Kunena attended a Transvaal ANC gathering where he listened to Mandela's No Easy Walk to Freedom speech. This speech, influenced by the Indian independence leader Jawaharlal Nehru, detailed a backup strategy for an ANC ban. Known as the Mandela Plan, or M-Plan, it suggested splitting the organization into smaller groups led by a central authority. Mandela began his career as a lawyer at Turblanche and Brigish before joining Hellman and Michel, a liberal firm. He successfully passed the bar exam to become a practicing attorney. In August 1953, Mandela and his comrade, Nelson Mandela, opened their own law firm, Mandela and Tambo, in the heart of Johannesburg. Being the sole African-owned law firm in the nation, it quickly gained popularity among black clients, especially those seeking legal representation against police misconduct. Backslash. However, its controversial nature led to the firm being forced to move due to the Group Areas Act, which negatively affected its client base. As a lawyer from a noble background, Mandela was a member of Johannesburg's upper echelon of African middle class and was highly esteemed within the African community. Yet, his personal life faced difficulties. Despite the birth of his second daughter, Mikazue Fumia, in May 1954, Mandela's relationship with Evelyn Mace deteriorated, with accusations of infidelity. There were rumors of affairs with ANC member Lillian Ngoi and Secretary Ruth Mompati, with some suggesting Mompati was the mother of his child. Disappointed by his actions, Mandela's mother, Nosakini, went back to Transke, while Evelyn turned to the Jehovah's Witnesses and distanced herself from Mandela's political activities. Despite these personal struggles, Mandela persisted in his activism with a strong resolve. He remained dedicated to the fight against apartheid, working tirelessly to bring together South Africans from different racial and ideological backgrounds in the pursuit of justice and equality. His efforts during this time set the stage for his future leadership and his status as an international icon of resistance against oppression. Congress of the People and the Treason Trial, 1955-1961 In February 1955, Nelson Mandela took part in a demonstration against the forced removal of African people from Sophiatown, Johannesburg. This demonstration failed, prompting Mandela to believe that violent measures might be necessary to overthrow apartheid and the rule of the white minority. He suggested to Sisulu that they should look for weapons in the People's Republic of China, but this proposal was turned down. The Chinese authorities thought the movement was not ready for guerrilla warfare. The African National Congress, together with the South African Indian Congress, the Colored People's Congress, the South African Congress of Trade Unions, and the Congress of Democrats, put together a Congress of the People. They invited all South Africans to present their ideas for a future after apartheid, leading to the creation of the Freedom Charter by Rusty Bernstein. This charter advocated for a democratic, non-racial nation with state-owned industries and was approved at a June 1955 meeting in Cliptown, which was interrupted by the police. The Freedom Charter became a key document for Mandela, who referred to it as, an inspiration to the people of South Africa, in 1956. Following his release from his second ban in September 1955, Mandela traveled to Transke to discuss the Bantu Authorities Act, 1951 with local Kosa chiefs. He also made visits to his mother and South Africa before moving to Cape Town. In March 1956, he was once again banned from public appearances, limiting him to Johannesburg for five years, though he frequently broke this rule. During this time, Mandela's marriage to Evelyn Mays fell apart, leading her to move back with her brother and file for divorce in May 1956, accusing Mandela of physical violence, which he denied. The divorce was completed in March 1958, with Evelyn being awarded custody of the children. During the divorce, Mandela began a relationship with Winnie Matakazila, a social worker, whom he married in June 1958. They had two children, Zenani, born February 1959, and Zin 1960-2020. In December 1956, Mandela and the majority of the ANC's national leadership were apprehended together on charges of high treason against the government. They were detained in Johannesburg prison amidst widespread demonstrations, and underwent an initial evaluation before being released on bail. 
The legal team, headed by Vernon Barange, started to challenge the accusations in January 1957. By January 1958, Oswald Pirro took over as the prosecutor, and in February, the court decided that the defendants should proceed with their trial in the Transvaal Supreme Court. The official treason trial commenced in Pretoria in August 1958, with the defendants successfully replacing the three judges who were associated with the National Party. In August, one of the charges was dismissed, and in October, the prosecution dropped its case, presenting a revised version in November that accused the ANC's leadership of promoting violent uprisings, a claim the defendants denied. In April 1959, members of the Africanists who were unhappy with the ANC's approach to racial inclusivity established the Pan-Africanist Congress PAC. Mandela disagreed with the PAC's stance on racial exclusivity, describing it as immature and naive. Both the ANC and PAC took part in a campaign against pass laws in the early 1960s, during which Africans destroyed their passes. The PAC-led rally in Sharpeville turned into a disaster when the police opened fire on the crowd, resulting in the death of 69 individuals, known as the Sharpeville Massacre. This event received global criticism and sparked widespread riots in South Africa, with Mandela publicly destroying his pass in support. In reaction, the government declared a state of emergency, imposed martial law, and prohibited the ANC and PAC. Mandela and other activists were arrested and spent five months in pretrial detention in poor conditions at Pretoria local prison. This period of imprisonment made it difficult for their lawyers to access them, leading to their withdrawal until the state of emergency was lifted in late August 1960. Mandela then convened the All-In African Conference near Peter Maritzburg, Natal, in March 1961, where 1,400 delegates from the anti-apartheid movement agreed to a stay-at-home strike for May 31st, the day South Africa became a republic. On March 29, 1961, after six years of the treason trial, the judges declared a not guilty verdict, stating that there was not enough evidence to convict the defendants of high treason. This decision was a major embarrassment for the government. MK, the SACP, and African Tour, 1961-62 Wearing the guise of a driver, Mandela secretly moved around South Africa, carefully setting up the ANC's new structure and planning a large-scale stay-at-home protest. The media nicknamed him the Black Pimpernel, a title taken from Emma Ortsy's The Scarlet Pimpernel, due to the intense attention from the police who issued a search warrant for his arrest. Despite his secretive activities, Mandela secretly met with reporters, warning them that not addressing the issues causing unrest could lead to violence by groups like the Pax Poco. Mandela's push for the ANC to create a military branch gained support even from hardliners like Albert Lutuli, who was against violence. Motivated by the success of Fidel Castro's 26th of July movement in the Cuban Revolution, Mandela, along with Walter Sisulu and Joe Slovo, founded Umkanto Wisizwi, Spear of the Nation, or MK, in 1961. At first, it was seen as a separate group from the ANC to protect the organization's political reputation, but it later became recognized as the ANC's armed force. Working in secret, MK initially included mostly white communists who provided safe houses for Mandela. After a while, Mandela moved to Lily's Leaf Farm in Rivonia, owned by communists, where the basic principles and rules of MK were developed with Raymond Mwaba, Joe Slovo, and Rusty Bernstein. Mandela publicly denied being a member of the Communist Party for strategic reasons during his life, but after his death, research and recognition from the SACP. An ANC proved his membership, showing his support for Marxist ideas and the fight against class oppression. MK's strategy was to operate through a network of small, independent groups, focusing on sabotage against key targets like military bases, power plants, and transportation facilities at off-peak times to reduce harm to civilians. After receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for ANC leader Albert Lutuli, MK made its mark with a series of coordinated bombings on Dingane's Day, December 16, 1961, and more attacks on New Year's Eve. In February 1962, Mandela was sent as an ANC representative to the Pan-African Freedom Movement for East, Central, and Southern Africa, PAFMEXA, in Addis Ababa. Leaving South Africa secretly via Bechuanaland, 
now Botswana, Mandela strategically paused in Tanganyika, now Tanzania, to converse with President Julius Nyerere, and in Ethiopia, where he interacted with Emperor Haile Selassie I and gave a speech after Selassie's speech. Following this, Mandela journeyed to Cairo, Egypt, where he praised President Gamal Abdel Nasser's political reforms. And to Morocco, Mali, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Senegal, where he managed to obtain financial backing and resources for MK's activities from various African figures, including Liberian President William Tubman and Guinean President Ahmed Seko Touré. His trip to London, England, allowed him to meet with anti-apartheid activists and secure global backing for the fight against apartheid. On his way back to Ethiopia, Mandela began a focused training in guerrilla warfare before being called back to South Africa by the ANC leadership, which was a critical turning point in his position as a leader and strategist in the fight against apartheid. Imprisonment Arrest and Rivonia Trial, 1962-1964 On August 5, 1962, Nelson Mandela was captured by the police close to Howick, with the activist Cecil Williams also in custody. Mandela's comrades in Amkanto we Sizwi, MK, harbored doubts about the police's unexpected capture, suspecting they might have been warned about Mandela's location, though Mandela himself brushed off these concerns. It was later disclosed by a retired U.S. diplomat, Donald Ricard, that the Central Intelligence Agency had leaked the South African police the location of Mandela, worried about his communist affiliations. He was initially detained at Johannesburg's Marshall Square jail and faced accusations like inciting labor strikes and leaving the country without authorization. Attending his own trial with legal counsel from Joe Slovo, Mandela used the proceedings to highlight the ANC's stance against racial discrimination, emphasizing his commitment to public protestations through demonstrations in the vicinity of the courthouse. Following his transfer to Pretoria, Mandela started studying for a Bachelor of Laws, LLB, degree from the University of London International Programs. The trial commenced in October, characterized by Mandela's deliberate efforts to stir up controversy, including his choice to wear traditional attire and use his self-representation to present political arguments during his defense. Despite the melodies of his supporters, singing Nkosi Cyclo I Africa as he exited the courtroom, Mandela was convicted and received a sentence of five years behind bars. In July 1963, a police operation at Lily's Leaf Farm led to additional arrests, with the discovery of documents hinting at Mandela's involvement with MK. The Rivonia trial began in October at the Pretoria Supreme Court, with Mandela and his associates on trial for charges of sabotage and conspiracy aimed at overthrowing the government. Faced by prosecutor Percy Yutter, the trial saw Mandela and his colleagues confess to acts of sabotage, while denying any intention to embark on a campaign of guerrilla warfare. Mandela's defining moment occurred during his three-hour I Am Prepared to Die address at the trial's start, drawing inspiration from the rebellious tone of Castro's, History Will Absolve Me. Despite efforts at censoring, Mandela's address captured international attention, prompting widespread calls for the acquittal of the defendants from global organizations like the United Nations and the World Peace Council. In the end, on June 12, 1964, Judge Cordes de Wet deemed Mandela and his co-defendants guilty on every count. Although the prosecution sought the death penalty, the judge opted for life imprisonment, cementing Mandela's status as a symbol of global resistance against apartheid. Robben Island, 1964-1982 In 1964, Nelson Mandela and his fellow defendants were moved from Pretoria to Robben Island Prison, where they would spend the next 18 years of their lives. Separated from other inmates in Section B, Mandela endured the tough conditions of a wet concrete cell, just 8 feet by 7 feet, with only a straw mat for a bed. He faced verbal and physical attacks from several white guards, and together with other prisoners from the Rivonia trial, were forced to do hard labor, such as breaking rocks into gravel. In January 1965, they were moved to a lime quarry, where Mandela suffered permanent damage to his eyesight from the bright light, made worse by the initial ban on wearing sunglasses. Despite these hardships, Mandela kept going. At night, he continued his studies for his LLB degree from the University of London through secret correspondence with Wolsey Hall, Oxford. His education was done secretly, as reading newspapers was not allowed, 
and he often faced solitary confinement for having smuggled in news articles. Initially labeled as a Class D prisoner, the lowest rank, he was only allowed one visitor and one letter every six months, both of which were heavily censored. Mandela and other political prisoners took part in work and hunger strikes to protest and better the conditions of the prison, seeing their resistance as part of the larger fight against apartheid. Inside the prison, Mandela emerged as a leader. He was chosen to be part of the four-person, high organ of ANC prisoners, along with Walter Sisulu, Govan Becky, and Raymond Mwaba. He also played a key role in Olundi, a group that represented all political prisoners on the island, building connections even with members of other groups like the PAC and Uchi Chan Club. Mandela started the University of Robben Island, where inmates taught and debated on various topics, including socio-political issues. Despite his deep faith in Christianity and regular attendance at Sunday services, Nelson Mandela delved into Islam and learned Afrikaans, aiming to connect with prison guards and sway them to his cause. Outside the prison, official guests such as the vocal liberal Helen Sussman from the Progressive Party offered crucial support, while discussions with world leaders like British Labour Party MP Dennis Healy highlighted Mandela's increasing international importance. His personal life was marked by significant challenges, his mother died in 1968, and he missed her funeral, while his eldest son, Thembai, was killed in a car crash the following year. Mandela's wife, Winnie, also faced political difficulties and was seldom allowed to visit him, even after her release in 1977. Conditions in the prison gradually got better from 1967, with improved clothing, more leisure activities, and better food for black inmates. However, attempts to escape were often stopped, including one in 1969 that Mandela was involved in, planned by Gordon Bruce and infiltrated by a South African Bureau of State Security agent aiming to eliminate Mandela during the escape. Initially, prison officials like Pete Badenhorst increased the severity of punishments, but Mandela's complaints to visiting judges led to Badenhorst's transfer to oversee prison operations, followed by a more cooperative approach from Commander Willie Willems, who aimed to better the prison conditions. By 1975, Mandela was moved to a higher security level, which allowed for more visits and correspondence. He kept in touch with key anti-apartheid leaders and began working on his autobiography, though the prison authorities confiscated several pages, leading to a four-year halt in his legal studies. During this time, Mandela took up gardening and extensive reading until he could resume his studies in 1980. As political dynamics shifted internally, Mandela's influence dipped in the late 1960s as attention shifted to figures such as Steve Biko and the Black Consciousness Movement BCM. Mandela tried to forge alliances with these younger activists, though he criticized their racialist beliefs and negative views towards white anti-apartheid activists. The international demand for Mandela's release grew louder around his 60th birthday in 1978, further boosted by accolades like an honorary degree from Lesotho, the Jawaharlal Nehru Award, and the freedom of the city of Glasgow in the years that followed. The catchphrase, Free Mandela, spread worldwide, sparking an international movement and prompting calls from the UN Security Council for his release, despite pushback from Cold War allies like US President Ronald Reagan and UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who saw the ANC as a communist sympathizer and terrorist group. Polesmore Prison, 1982-1988 In April 1982, Nelson Mandela and other key leaders of the African National Congress ANC, were transferred from Robben Island to Polesmore Prison in Cape Town. This move was viewed by the apartheid government as a strategy to separate them from the younger activists and diminish their influence. Polesmore provided slightly better living conditions than Robben Island, including the opportunity for Mandela to establish a rooftop garden, a small comfort that offered him a tranquil space for reflection while he was imprisoned. Under Brigadier Monroe's leadership, Mandela experienced a somewhat more lenient environment. He was permitted to read extensively and correspond more frequently, receiving as many as 52 letters annually. Despite these comforts, Mandela still longed for the sense of unity and solidarity he felt among his fellow political prisoners on Robben Island. During this time, Mandela was appointed as a patron of the United Democratic Front, UDF, 
a coalition formed to oppose the apartheid government's reforms that aimed to grant limited political rights to colored and Indian South Africans while excluding black Africans. This strategy, viewed by Mandela and the UDF as a means to divide the anti-apartheid movement along racial lines, was a significant concern. The early 1980s in South Africa were characterized by heightened political violence and economic decline. As international pressure increased, multinational banks and governments, in response to global anti-apartheid movements, began to divest from South Africa. Mandela's imprisonment became a central point of global protests and efforts to secure his release, despite the South African government's attempts to quell dissent and uphold apartheid policies. In February 1985, as calls for Mandela's release grew louder, President P. W. Bota proposed conditional freedom in exchange for Mandela's renouncement of violence as a political strategy. Mandela declined this offer, arguing that true freedom necessitated the abolition of the ANC and the freedom for its leaders to negotiate without constraints. Despite facing health issues, including surgery for an enlarged prostate gland in 1985, Mandela remained steadfast in his opposition to apartheid and continued to represent the cause of freedom and justice around the world. Throughout the mid-1980s, Mandela engaged in clandestine discussions with Minister of Justice Kobe Coetzee, exploring the possibility of negotiations with the apartheid government. These talks were part of broader efforts to seek a peaceful resolution to the escalating violence and political turmoil in South Africa. Mandela's leadership and perseverance during this period cemented his status as a global icon of resistance to apartheid and garnered him increasing international acclaim and support. Despite his global prominence, Mandela encountered personal difficulties. Reports surfaced of his wife Winnie's involvement in violent activities by the Mandela United Football Club in Soweto, leading to public scrutiny and demands for Mandela to distance himself from her actions. Despite these challenges, Mandela remained dedicated to his principles and awaited the outcome of legal proceedings concerning Winnie, demonstrating his unwavering commitment to justice and equality in South Africa. Victor Brewster Prison and Release, 1988-1990 After his battle with tuberculosis intensified due to the moist conditions in his cell, Mandela was moved to Victor Brewster Prison near Parle in December 1988. At this new location, he found himself in a more pleasant environment, living in a warder's home with his own chef, which allowed him to concentrate on finishing his law degree. Mandela seized the opportunity presented by the better living conditions to welcome many visitors and secretly communicate with the leader of the ANC, Oliver Tambo. In 1989, a major change took place in South African politics following President P. W. Bota's stroke. F. W. de Klerk then succeeded Bota, leading the National Party and starting reforms. In a surprising act, Bota invited Mandela to a tea meeting in July 1989, which Mandela saw as a friendly gesture. De Klerk, after becoming president just six weeks later, recognized the flaws in apartheid and began freeing ANC prisoners. The fall of the Berlin Wall in November 1989 further influenced de Klerk's decisions, leading him to legalize political parties that had been banned before and to publicly announce Mandela's unconditional release. Mandela stepped out of Victor Verster prison on February 11 to a celebratory welcome, holding Winnie's hand as he faced cheering crowds and worldwide media attention. His release was live-streamed globally. On his way to Cape Town's City Hall, Mandela gave a powerful speech about his dedication to peace and reconciliation with South Africa's white minority. He made it clear, however, that the ANC's fight would continue defensively against apartheid violence until a peaceful agreement could be reached. Mandela was hopeful about future talks that would secure the black majority's right to vote in national and local elections, a key step towards achieving equality and democracy. Following his stay at Archbishop Desmond Tutu's residence, Mandela met with a diverse group of supporters, activists, and journalists. He gave a moving speech to about 100,000 people at Johannesburg's FNB Stadium, where he shared his vision for a united and democratic South Africa. End of Apartheid Early Negotiations, 1990-91 Following his release, Nelson Mandela embarked on a comprehensive tour across Africa, visiting countries like Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Libya, and Algeria. 
He then journeyed to Sweden to meet with Oliver Tambo and to London to take part in the Nelson Mandela, an international tribute for a free South Africa concert at Wembley Stadium. During this time, Mandela was actively campaigning for international support for sanctions against the apartheid government. He engaged in discussions with French President François Mitterrand, Pope John Paul II at the Vatican, and British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. In the United States, he had meetings with President George H. W. Bush, spoke to both chambers of Congress, and made visits to eight cities, earning significant backing from the African-American community. His visit to Cuba deepened his bond with President Fidel Castro, whom he greatly respected. Mandela also had conversations with Indian President Arthur Venkataraman, Indonesian President Suharto, Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad, and Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke. He made a trip to Japan but refrained from visiting the Soviet Union, a country that had historically supported the ANC. In May 1990, Mandela led a diverse ANC delegation in initial talks with a group of Afrikaner leaders. His understanding of Afrikaner history impressed the government group, leading to the Groot Sure Minute, which ended the state of emergency declared by the government. In August, Mandela, recognizing the ANC's military disadvantage, suggested a ceasefire known as the Pretoria Minute, despite pushback from some MK members. Throughout 1990 and the years that followed, Mandela concentrated on bringing together and fortifying the ANC. He delivered a significant speech at a Johannesburg conference in December, attended by 1,600 participants, showcasing a more conciliatory approach than anticipated. At the ANC's National Conference in Durban in July 1991, Mandela acknowledged the party's flaws and presented strategies for achieving majority rule. He was elected ANC president at this gathering, succeeding Oliver Tambo, and managed the selection of a 50-member National Executive Committee. As he took up his new position, Mandela set up his office at the recently acquired ANC headquarters at Shell House in Johannesburg. At first, he resided with Winnie in her spacious home in Soweto, but their marriage began to deteriorate due to her affair with Dalim Pofu. Even though he stood by her during her legal battle for kidnapping and assault, their relationship encountered difficulties. He managed to gather financial support for her legal defense from global figures, including Muammar Gaddafi, but their split was made public in April 1992. Following this, the ANC expelled Whitney from the national executive for mishandling the party's funds, leading Mandela to relocate to the predominantly white neighborhood of Houghton in Johannesburg. During this time, Mandela dealt with a surge in black-on-black -black violence, especially involving ANC and Nkata Freedom Party members in KwaZulu-Natal, which led to many deaths. Mandela tried to mediate between Nkata Freedom Party leader Mengasuthu Buthalizi and himself, but the ANC's opposition obstructed any progress. He believed the violence was caused by a third force within the government's intelligence agencies, accusing President de Klerk of being involved in events such as the Sabokang massacre. Despite agreeing to a peace deal with Buthalizi and de Klerk at a national peace summit in September 1991, the violence continued, creating obstacles for Mandela's goal of achieving a peaceful transition in South Africa. Codessa Talks 1991-92 The Convention for a Democratic South Africa, CODESA, kicked off in December 1991 at the Johannesburg World Trade Center, hosting 228 representatives from 19 political parties. Cyril Ramaphosa was in charge of the ANC's team, while Nelson Mandela was a key player. By the end of the meeting, President de Klerk criticized the ANC for its violence in his address. Mandela took this opportunity to publicly call out de Klerk as the head of a corrupt and illegitimate group. Despite the power of the National Party and ANC, there was little progress in the negotiations. The second Codessa took place in May 1992, with de Klerk pushing for a federal setup with a rotating presidency to safeguard ethnic minorities after apartheid. Mandela disagreed, arguing for a centralized system under majority rule. After the Boypating massacre, where Nkata militants, backed by the government, killed ANC members, Mandela paused the talks. He went to a summit of the Organization of African Unity in Senegal, pushing for a UN Security Council resolution and the establishment of a UN peacekeeping force to stop what he called state terrorism. 
In August, the ANC led the biggest strike in South African history, with supporters staging a march on Pretoria. Following the Bisho massacre, where Siske Defense Force soldiers killed 28 ANC members during a protest, Mandela saw the violence rise and called back to the negotiating table in September. His demands included the release of all political prisoners, the prohibition of Zulu traditional weapons, and the enclosure of Zulu hostels, which de Klerk begrudgingly agreed to. Discussions led to a pact for a mixed-race nationwide election and the creation of a five-year alliance government of national harmony, together with a constitutional committee that allowed the National Party to maintain its power. The ANC also agreed to protect the employment of white government workers, which triggered backlash from within the party. Mandela and de Klerk concluded a temporary constitution based on democratic principles, ensuring the division of powers, the establishment of a constitutional court, and the inclusion of a constitution similar to that of the U.S. The nation was organized into nine regions, each governed by its own leader and civil service, striking a balance between de Klerk's desire for a federal system and Mandela's preference for a centralized government. The path to democracy was challenged by the concerned South Africans group, COSAG, a coalition that included Nkata and far-right Afrikaner parties pushing for the separation of ethnic groups. In June 1993, the right-wing Afrikaner were stands bewedging, AWB, attacked the Kempton Park World Trade Center. After the killing of ANC activist Chris Hani, Mandela gave a widely seen speech to quell the violence and participated in a large funeral in Soweto for Oliver Tambo, who had died recently. In July 1993, Mandela and de Klerk each went to the United States, where they met with President Bill Clinton and were honored with the Liberty Medal. They were jointly recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize in Norway shortly after. Inspired by Thabo Mbeki, Mandela started to work with business figures and softened his position on nationalizing industries to attract international investment, despite opposition from socialist groups within the ANC. This change in approach was supported by representatives from the Chinese and Vietnamese Communist parties at the January 1992 World Economic Forum in Switzerland. General Election, 1994 As the April 27, 1994 election drew near, the African National Congress ANC, launched a comprehensive campaign, setting up 100 election centers and holding people's forums across the country, featuring prominent appearances by Nelson Mandela, who was highly respected among black South Africans. The ANC campaigned on a Reconstruction and Development Program RDP, promising to construct a million homes in five years, ensure free education for all, and improve access to vital services like water and electricity, under the catchphrase, a better life for everyone. The funding for these grand plans was not clearly stated, leading to doubts among the South African media, especially those not supportive of Mandela, who were concerned about continuing ethnic conflicts and backed the National or Democratic Party instead. Mandela concentrated on raising funds for the ANC, traveling extensively to North America, Europe, and Asia to attract wealthy benefactors, including supporters of the apartheid government. His proposal to reduce the voting age from 18 to 14 was rejected by the ANC but became a target for mockery. Worries about the COSAG potentially causing election disruptions were heightened by violence in Boputaswana and events such as the Shell House Massacre, which involved the AWB and Nkata. Mandela engaged in talks with Afrikaner leaders and military figures like P. W. Thabota, Pik Bota, and Constant Viljoen, convincing many to join the democratic process. Backslash. He also negotiated with Nkata's Buthalizi to contest the elections rather than seeking to secede. In a significant development, Mandela and President de Klerk took part in a televised debate, where Mandela's surprising offer to shake de Klerk's hand was seen as a significant step towards reconciliation. The election went on with little violence, although an AWB cell carried out lethal car bombings, resulting in the deaths of 20 people. As expected, the ANC won the election with 63% of the vote, just short of the two-thirds majority needed to unilaterally amend the constitution. The ANC emerged victorious in seven provinces, while Nkata and the National Party each won one. Mandela cast his ballot at Olange High School in Durban, publicly acknowledging that despite the ANC's victory in the election, the process had been tainted by fraud and sabotage. Presidency of South Africa, 
1994 to 1999. After being elected, Nelson Mandela became the first black leader of South Africa, taking office in Pretoria on May 10, 1994, a ceremony watched by one billion people worldwide. The event was graced by 4,000 guests, including global leaders from various regions and political views, with Mandela at the helm of a coalition government that included members from the African National Congress ANC, the National Party, and Nkata, all following the guidelines of the interim constitution. Thabo Mbeki and former President F.W. de Klerk were chosen as deputy presidents, a decision Mandela was initially unsure about but later found value in Mbeki's advice in policy formation. Selecting the presidential residence at Tuanhuis in Cape Town, Mandela allowed de Klerk to keep the Groot Schur mansion, choosing instead the adjacent Westbrook estate, renamed Genedendal, which means Valley of Mercy, in Afrikaans. He also lived in Houghton and Kunu, where he was actively involved in local matters and worked to settle tribal conflicts. Despite being 76 years old and facing health challenges, Mandela stayed active and often felt lonely. He welcomed celebrities like Michael Jackson and Whoopi Goldberg, formed friendships with affluent businessmen like Harry Oppenheimer, and even had a meeting with Queen Elizabeth II during her 1995 visit to South Africa, which drew backlash from some within the ANC who were critical of his ties to the monarchy. Despite his high-profile connections, Mandela led a simple life, donating a third of his earnings to the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, which he founded in 1995. Mandela was a strong advocate for freedom of the press, working to dismantle censorship and build relationships with journalists, though he also criticized the media for its focus on sensational crime stories and its lack of diversity. In December 1994, Mandela released Long Walk to Freedom, a book based on a manuscript he wrote while in prison, co-written by American journalist Richard Stengel. At the ANC's 49th conference in late 1994, which saw the election of a more assertive national executive, Mandela's wife Winnie expressed a wish to reconcile, but he chose to start divorce proceedings in 1995. By that time, Mandela had begun a relationship with Graca Marshall, a political activist from Mozambique and the widow of former President Samora Marshall. Their friendship grew over time, and Marshall often accompanied Mandela on his international trips, dividing her time between Mozambique and Johannesburg, initially rejecting his proposal for marriage to preserve her independence. National Reconciliation During his time as President of South Africa, Nelson Mandela played a crucial role in guiding the country from the era of apartheid to a multicultural democracy. He prioritized national reconciliation as a key goal, working to ease the concerns of the white community and ensure their inclusion in the emerging rainbow nation. Despite the ANC's leading role in the government of national unity, Mandela made a concerted effort to include diverse perspectives by appointing individuals from the apartheid period, such as F.W. de Klerk, as deputy president and other national party members to important ministerial roles. His cabinet also featured younger leaders like Tito Mbawini and Jeff Radebe, alongside experienced ANC members. The relationship between Mandela and de Klerk was fraught with tension, particularly over issues like granting amnesty to police officers and legal protections for those who were part of the apartheid regime. However, Mandela made it a point to engage with those from the apartheid era, advocating for forgiveness and reconciliation as key elements in South Africa's recovery. His actions, such as supporting the South African national rugby team, the Springboks, during the 1995 Rugby World Cup, demonstrated his dedication to overcoming racial divides. His gesture of wearing a Springbok jersey and presenting the trophy to team captain Francois Pinar after their win was a powerful symbol of unity among South Africans of all races. Mandela faced criticism from more extreme groups, including his estranged wife Winnie Mandela, who questioned his approach to reconciliation. Despite this, he continued to push for the creation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission TRC, led by Desmond Tutu, which was tasked with investigating the atrocities of the apartheid era. The TRC's investigations were controversial but were recognized by Mandela as essential for South Africa to confront its history and work towards a unified future. Throughout his presidency, Mandela remained steadfast in his commitment to reconciliation, viewing it as a fundamental step towards South Africa's advancement beyond its turbulent past. 
His leadership during this critical period established the groundwork for a democratic South Africa, focusing on justice, forgiveness, and unity in the face of complex challenges. Domestic Programs Mandela assumed office during a critical juncture for South Africa, inheriting a country deeply scarred by the legacy of apartheid. With a population of 40 million, it was clear that vast inequalities existed, 23 million were without electricity or proper sanitation, 12 million had no access to clean water. And the unemployment rate was a staggering 33%. More than half of the population was living in poverty, highlighting the daunting challenges Mandela's government had to confront from the start. From an economic standpoint, South Africa was burdened with significant obstacles, including depleted financial resources and a large portion of the budget being dedicated to paying off debts. This limited the scope of the ambitious Reconstruction and Development Program RDP, Mandela had campaigned on. In response, the government shifted its strategy in 1996 towards the growth, employment and redistribution gear, policy, aiming for economic expansion through market-friendly reforms and attracting foreign investment. However, this approach was met with criticism within the African National Congress ANC, for its perceived neoliberal tendencies. Despite these financial limitations, Mandela's administration took on critical social reforms. The budget for welfare spending saw significant increases, with the goal of achieving equality in grant distribution among different racial groups. Free healthcare was made available to children and pregnant women, which was later extended to all users of primary healthcare. By 1999, the government had accomplished several key objectives, reached 3 million people with telephone services, enrolled 1.5 million children in schools, upgraded 500 clinics, electrified 2 million homes, provided water access to 3 million people, and built 750,000 houses. Mandela's term was also marked by legislative changes. The Land Reform Act of 1996 protected the rights of workers on leased land, while tougher regulations on the arms industry were put in place to prevent the sale of weapons to authoritarian governments. He also emphasized the importance of tourism as a key economic sector, recognizing its potential for growth and job creation. However, Mandela's administration was not without criticism. The handling of the HIV-AIDS epidemic, which was affecting 10% of the population by 1999, was particularly scrutinized, with calls for more aggressive action. Mandela later acknowledged the shortcomings of his government's initial response to the pandemic. High crime rates and allegations of corruption also eroded public trust. Furthermore, Mandela had to navigate demographic changes, including a significant outflow of skilled white South Africans and an increase in illegal immigration, each bringing its own set of socioeconomic challenges. Mandela encouraged unity and acceptance, urging South Africans to embrace diversity in the face of these changes. Despite these challenges, Mandela's presidency laid the foundation for a more inclusive and economically robust South Africa. His dedication to reconciliation and social justice continues to influence the country's direction cementing his legacy as a beacon of hope and transformation. Foreign Affairs During his time as president, Nelson Mandela was deeply committed to integrating human rights principles at the heart of South Africa's dealings with the international community, pushing for peaceful solutions to conflicts and efforts at reconciliation worldwide. Leveraging South Africa's successful move from apartheid to democracy, Mandela used his global influence to advocate for peaceful negotiations over confrontations. As the leader of the non-aligned movement from September 1998, Mandela brought together world leaders in Durban to confront the Israeli government's tactics of delaying the peace process with Palestine. His push for talks between India and Pakistan to settle the Kashmir dispute was a testament to his faith in dialogue as a means for achieving peace. In terms of the economy, Mandela aimed to strengthen economic ties with East Asia, particularly with Malaysia, with the goal of broadening South Africa's network of international partners. However, these ambitions were complicated by the 1997 Asian financial crisis, which affected the stability of the global economy. Despite these obstacles, Mandela skillfully managed diplomatic relations, eventually recognizing the People's Republic of China while ending formal ties with Taiwan under pressure from Beijing, aligning South Africa with the One China policy. 
Mandela's approach to foreign policy was not without controversy. Criticism from Western countries did not deter Mandela from maintaining diplomatic relations with leaders such as Indonesia's Suharto, highlighting the importance of engagement over isolation as a means to effect positive change. His dealings with countries like Syria, Cuba, and Libya, which were seen as controversial by Western standards, were defended by Mandela as essential for South Africa's independence and its stance against Western hegemony. In the realm of regional issues, Mandela championed the idea of an African Renaissance, pushing for solutions to African problems within Africa. He played key roles in mediating efforts during the First Congo War with the aim of stabilizing the unstable Great Lakes region, and in brokering talks between conflicting groups in Burundi's ethnic conflict. Despite these efforts, the deep-seated ethnic tensions posed a challenge to Mandela's vision of a unified and stable Africa. On a domestic level, Mandela authorized South African military intervention in Lesotho in 1998 to back Prime Minister Pakalitha Mosisilai's government amidst political turmoil. While Mandela supported the intervention, it was carried out by acting President Buthalizi while Mandela was away, highlighting the complexities involved in regional leadership and managing crises in southern Africa. Mandela's foreign policy legacy is a testament to his steadfast dedication to global justice, human rights, and the unity of Africa. His strategy in international relations sought to position South Africa as a beacon for peace and reconciliation, skillfully navigating complex global situations while advancing Africa's interests on the international stage. Withdrawing from Politics the enactment of South Africa's new constitution in May 1996 marked a significant milestone in the country's journey towards democracy. It was crafted to establish a solid governance structure with effective safeguards against the misuse of political and administrative authority. However, not all were in favor of this crucial document. Former President F. W. de Klerk and his National Party were opposed to its implementation, citing concerns about what they saw as unfair treatment by the ANC-led government. In response, the National Party withdrew from the coalition government, which had been a key component of the Government of National Unity established after the 1994 elections. Under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, the ANC filled the vacant cabinet seats left by the Nationals, thereby cementing its dominance in the government. Thabo Mbeki, who had been deputy president alongside de Klerk, took over the position by himself, indicating a shift in the balance of power within the ruling coalition. Throughout Mandela's presidency, his relationship with Chief Mengasuthu Buthalizi of the Nkata Freedom Party IFP, underwent notable changes. Initially characterized by tension and historical disputes, Mandela's efforts towards reconciliation reached Buthalizi, who eventually played a crucial role during times when both Mandela and Becky were absent from the country, acting as acting president. This action highlighted Mandela's commitment to promoting unity and stability across South Africa's varied political landscape. By late 1997, Mandela chose not to seek re-election as president of the ANC, a decision that surprised some within the party. He publicly supported Cyril Ramaphosa, a leading ANC figure, as his preferred successor, believing him to be someone who could lead the party forward with a pragmatic and inclusive strategy. However, despite Mandela's endorsement, Thabo Mbeki won the party elections, succeeding Mandela as the new president of the ANC. This transition shed light on the ANC's internal workings and the changing leadership within the party after apartheid. In his personal life, Mandela's bond with Graca Marshall grew stronger, culminating in their marriage in July 1998. The wedding, held on Mandela's 80th birthday, was a lavish affair attended by numerous dignitaries and friends from around the globe, reflecting Mandela's status as a worldwide symbol of reconciliation and leadership. In March 1999, Mandela delivered his farewell speech to Parliament, marking the conclusion of his presidency and his exit from active political life. Despite the challenges faced by the ANC government during his time in office, Mandela remained immensely popular among the people of South Africa, with polls showing high approval ratings, highlighting his lasting legacy as a leader who steered South Africa through a critical period of transition and change. Post-Presidency and Final Years Continued Activism and Philanthropy, 1999-2004 In June 1999, after stepping down from active political life, 
Mandela planned to lead a serene existence between Johannesburg and Kunu. His ambition to pen a continuation of his autobiography, titled The Presidential Years, was left unfinished until it was published posthumously in 2017. However, Mandela struggled with solitude and quickly returned to a hectic public life, participating in daily activities, meetings with world leaders and celebrities, and actively contributing to the Nelson Mandela Foundation, which was founded in 1999 with a focus on rural development, building schools, and fighting HIV-AIDS. Despite facing criticism for his approach to the HIV-AIDS epidemic during his time in office, Mandela was committed to the cause after his retirement, describing it as a battle that had taken more lives than all previous wars. He supported the Treatment Action Campaign, pushing for better access to antiretroviral drugs for those living with HIV in South Africa. Moreover, Mandela successfully battled prostate cancer in July 2001. Over the years, Mandela continued to broaden his charitable work. He launched the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture in 2002 and played a key role in creating the Mandela Rhodes Foundation at Rhodes House, University of Oxford, which provided scholarships for African students pursuing postgraduate studies. His efforts also included establishing the Nelson Mandela Center of Memory and starting the 46664 campaign against HIV-AIDS. Mandela remained a leading figure on the international stage, delivering the closing speech at the 13 International AIDS Conference in Durban in 2000 and speaking at the 15 International AIDS Conference in Bangkok in 2004, where he called for greater efforts to tackle tuberculosis in addition to HIV-AIDS. He also shared the news of his son Makatho's death from AIDS in January 2005, aiming to challenge the stigma associated with the disease. As he grew more vocal in his later years, Mandela criticized Western nations' military actions. He strongly opposed NATO's 1999 intervention in Kosovo, viewing it as an overreach by powerful countries. Similarly, he expressed his opposition to the United States' decision to go to war in Iraq in 2003, calling it a regrettable move and criticizing President George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair for disregarding the United Nations and suggesting hidden motives related to Iraqi oil. Mandela's outspoken nature sometimes led to controversy, especially when he criticized the United States for its past atrocities, including the atomic bombings of Japan. Despite these criticisms, Mandela later mended his relationship with President Bush. Continuing to be active in global affairs, Mandela visited Abdelbaset Al-Megrahi, a suspect in the Lockerbie bombing, in Barlini prison, publicly criticizing the harsh conditions of his detention as psychological torture. Retiring from Retirement, 2004 to 2013 In June 2004, at 85 years old and dealing with worsening health, Mandela declared his retirement from retirement, stepping away from the limelight with the remark, don't call me, I will call you. Despite reducing his appearances in public and declining most requests for interviews, he kept in touch with his close friends and family, while the foundation discouraged any public gatherings. Continuing his involvement in global issues, Mandela set up the Nelson Mandela Legacy Trust in 2005. He visited the United States to speak about aid for Africa at places like the Brookings Institution and the NAACP. During this period, he had meetings with U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton, President George W. Bush, and his first encounter with then-Senator Barack Obama. Mandela also encouraged Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe to step down due to escalating human rights violations, publicly advocating for his resignation in 2007. In 2007, Mandela, together with Graca Marshall and Desmond Tutu, brought together world leaders in Johannesburg to address global issues, establishing the Elders, a group he announced on his 89th birthday. The 90th birthday of Mandela in July 2008 was celebrated across the country, including a tribute concert in Hyde Park, London. Throughout Thabo Mbeki's term, Mandela was a loyal supporter of the ANC, often dominating Mbeki at joint events. He developed a better relationship with Mbeki's successor, Jacob Zuma, although the Nelson Mandela Foundation criticized his grandson Mandla Mandela for flying him to a Prozuma rally in the Eastern Cape during a storm in 2009. In 2004, Mandela successfully campaigned for South Africa to host the 2010 FIFA World Cup, 
viewing it as a suitable present for the decade following the end of apartheid. Despite his health issues, Mandela made his last public appearance at the World Cup's closing ceremony, receiving widespread praise. From 2005 to 2013, Mandela and his family were embroiled in legal battles over the assets and family trusts for his descendants. By mid-2013, as Mandela was fighting a lung infection in Pretoria, family disputes over the burial sites of his children were at their peak, highlighting the ongoing family conflicts. Illness and Death, 2011-2013 In February 2011, Nelson Mandela was briefly hospitalized due to a respiratory infection, which garnered worldwide attention. This was followed by a second hospital stay in December 2012 for a lung infection and the removal of a gallstone. Despite a successful operation in early March 2013, he was reinfected with the lung condition, leading to his third hospitalization in Pretoria. By June 2013, Mandela's health had worsened, requiring him to be admitted to Pretoria's hospital in critical condition. Archbishop Thabo Makoba of Cape Town paid Mandela a visit, offering prayers with Graca Marshall, while President Zuma postponed his Mozambique visit to be with Mandela the following day. In September 2013, Mandela was released from the hospital, though he remained in a delicate state of health. After battling a long-term respiratory illness, Mandela passed away on December 5, 2013 at the age of 95, around 2050 local time at his residence in Houghton, surrounded by his loved ones. President Zuma announced Mandela's demise on television, declaring 10 days of national mourning and planning a memorial service at Johannesburg's FNB Stadium for December 10, 2013, with December 8 set aside as a day for national prayer and reflection. Mandela's remains were on display from 11 to December 13 at the Union Buildings in Pretoria, after which a state funeral was held on December 15 in Kunu. Around 90 delegates from foreign countries came to South Africa to participate in the memorial events. It was later disclosed that 300 million rand, approximately $20 million, that was initially set aside for humanitarian projects was instead used to cover the costs of the funeral. The media was inundated with tributes and reflections, while social media was filled with images and messages in honor of Mandela. His estate, valued at 4.1 million US dollars, was distributed among his wife, other relatives, staff, and educational institutions. Political Ideology Mandela identified himself as both a supporter of African independence and a socialist, a position he maintained since his involvement with the ANC. He was mainly a hands-on politician, lacking the academic background of a scholar or theorist. Tom Lodge, a biographer, noted that for Mandela, Politics was more about crafting stories of ethical behavior, focusing on actions rather than abstract principles. Sabello J. Anglovagacini, a historian, described Mandela as a liberal African nationalist decolonial humanist, while Raymond Suttner, a political analyst, questioned the simplicity of labeling Mandela as liberal, pointing out his complex political ideology. Mandela was influenced by a variety of figures including leaders of India's independence movement like Gandhi and Nehru, activists of the civil rights movement in the United States, and other African nationalists such as Krumah, adapting their concepts to fit the South African situation while avoiding the anti-white views common among some African nationalists. This blend included elements from both countercultural and dominant Afrikaner nationalism, using the latter to further his cause against apartheid. His education in law played a crucial role in shaping Mandela's political journey. At first, he advocated for change through non-violent means, advocating for a legal revolution. However, as apartheid suppression grew, he had to reluctantly consider the use of violence. Over time, Mandela moved towards a non-violent strategy centered on negotiation and healing. His use of violence was strategic, designed to encourage his opponents to engage in discussions rather than escalating into a race conflict. This strategic approach sets Mandela apart from Gundayism, though he has been occasionally compared to him by some commentators looking for ideological similarities. Democracy In his speeches, Mandela sometimes seemed to adopt a dictatorial stance, yet he was unwavering in his support for democratic principles, always following the will of the majority, even when it conflicted with his own views. 
His dedication to democratic ideals and human rights dates back to the 1960s, where he was a firm believer in the importance of inclusivity, responsibility, and the right to free expression as the core of democracy. His conviction in the rights of both nature and humanity was a constant motivation throughout his political journey. Political commentator Raymond Suttner observed Mandela's balanced leadership style, which included both group decision-making and instances where he took unilateral action to meet certain objectives. According to biographer Tom Lodge, Mandela's political ideology was marked by a conflict between his endorsement of modern liberal democracy and the traditional African consensus decision-making practices. Despite his respect for the parliamentary democracy of the British, which he considered the pinnacle of democracy, Mandela also valued native governance systems. He had a sophisticated outlook, valuing both the democratic frameworks of the West and the democratic spirit of the traditional Kosa community. This viewpoint set him apart from other African nationalist and socialist figures who were cautious about embracing Western democratic models they saw as alien to African cultural heritage. Socialism and Marxism Mandela championed the idea of a society without social classes, rejecting the principles of capitalism, private ownership of property, and the power of the financial elite, as outlined by Anthony Sampson. He was drawn to Marxist ideas and supported the concept of scientific socialism during the fight for revolution. Even though he denied any ties to communism during the treason trial and subsequent discussions, Mandela recognized the value of working with the South African Communist Party SACP, pondering whether the ANC had done a better job of leveraging their partnership. Sociologist Craig Saudian described Mandela as having a soft spot for socialism but not being a strict adherent to communist ideology. David Jones Smith, the author of Mandela's biography, suggested that Mandela adopted communist beliefs in the late 1950s and early 1960s, a perspective backed by historian Stephen Ellis, who found proof of Mandela's active involvement in the SACP during that era. This involvement was later acknowledged by both the ANC and SACP, with the latter disclosing his position on the Central Committee, a role the ANC had kept secret to protect Western backing. Despite his socialist leanings, Mandela was a strong advocate for democracy, setting him apart from Marxist-Leninists who saw Western governments as inherently undemocratic. The 1955 Freedom Charter, a joint effort by Mandela, called for the nationalization of banks, gold mines, and land to achieve economic equality. Yet, during his time as president, Mandela pursued policies of privatization that aligned with the global economic shifts of the era. This change was partly due to the fall of socialist governments in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in the early 1990s. Despite his earlier socialist goals, Mandela's practical approach to governance was shaped by the realities of international politics and economics throughout his presidency. Personality and Personal Life Mandela's magnetic leadership was widely recognized, marked by his knack for engaging and motivating others, as pointed out by biographer Mary Benson who referred to him as a natural leader of the masses with an inherent talent for drawing people in. This charm went beyond just looks, it was rooted in his deep dedication to the ideals of fairness, equality, and freedom, which he expressed through his deeds and his public presence. Throughout his life, Mandela was mindful of his public image, often seen in well-fitted attire that highlighted his noble character. This attention to detail was more than just for show, it projected an image of respect and authority that appealed to both his supporters and his critics. His noble background was frequently mentioned by his followers, further boosting his charismatic influence and symbolic importance. In the 1950s, while residing in Johannesburg, Mandela intentionally cultivated an image of an African gentleman. He adopted a style characterized by perfectly pressed clothes, polished etiquette, and measured orations. This image, as examined by Tom Lodge, positioned Mandela not just as a political figure but also as a visual icon of a progressive, free African leader, a trailblazer of a new age. His choice of clothing also became iconic. The vividly colored batik shirts, later known as Madiba shirts, became synonymous with Mandela's presidency and were part of his deliberate efforts to project a unique and confident image to the world. This sartorial decision, according to Lodge, played a role in Mandela becoming one of the first media politicians, effectively using fashion and charm to spread his message of transformation and hope.
Betty Glad and Robert Blanton, political analysts, highlighted Mandela's exceptional intelligence, cunning, and steadfast loyalty, a combination of traits that enhanced his charismatic appeal. Anthony Sampson, his biographer, pointed out Mandela's ability to shape his public image, excel in media appearances, and craft memorable phrases that struck a chord with the audience. Despite his formal and sometimes cliched approach to public speaking, Mandela's orations reflected his personal dedication to democracy, justice, and healing. His deliberate tempo and careful selection of words, noted by observers, showed his deep sincerity and conviction. Although not known for his fiery orations, Mandela's speeches were effective in conveying his vision and garnering support for his cause. In private, Mandela was recognized for his reserved nature, often hiding his feelings and confiding in a select few. His simple lifestyle, marked by his abstinence from alcohol and tobacco, and his practice of making his bed, even while serving as the president, highlighted his humility and commitment to a simple way of life. Despite his serious public persona, Mandela had a fun and playful side to his personality, which made him likable among his peers. He was both strict and loving in his interactions, particularly with his grandchildren, managing to combine a serious attitude with moments of lightheartedness and warmth. Mandela's commitment to British customs and manners, which he referred to as an Anglophile, showed his appreciation for politeness and proper behavior. He treated everyone with dignity, no matter their position, and was celebrated for his skill in engaging with individuals from diverse backgrounds. His approach to leading was inclusive, even when it came to supporting political adversaries of his allies, showcasing his dedication to peaceful discussions and healing. His private life, which included his relationships with Evelyn Toko Mays, Winnie Matakazila Mandela, Graca Marshall, and his romantic endeavors, offered insights into Mandela's personal life. Despite facing personal difficulties and controversies, Mandela's enduring legacy as a captivating leader and advocate for democracy, human rights, and healing continues to inspire and guide people around the globe. Reception and Legacy By the time Nelson Mandela died, he had risen to become not just a beloved figure in South Africa but also a worldwide emblem of perseverance, fairness, and unity. In South Africa, he was lovingly called the father of the nation, a moniker that highlighted his crucial role in guiding the country out of apartheid and into a democratic era. He was also celebrated as the founding father of democracy for his key role in negotiating a peaceful shift from minority rule to majority rule. On the international stage, Mandela achieved legendary status, recognized as a towering figure of moral leadership and a symbol of resistance to oppression. Rita Barnard's description of him as one of the most revered figures of our time underscores the deep impact Mandela had beyond his own country. His influence went beyond national and cultural boundaries, earning him respect as a modern democratic hero for his unwavering dedication to human rights and equality. Even with his worldwide recognition, Mandela remained modest about his contributions, often downplaying any claims of being a savior figure. He frequently pointed out that he was just an average person who found himself in extraordinary situations, crediting his leadership to the collective efforts of many. In the company of Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., Mandela is frequently mentioned as one of the foremost leaders in the fight against racism and colonialism of the 20th century. Elite Bamer's portrayal of him as a universal symbol of social justice captures the wide appeal of his message of tolerance, reconciliation, and democratic values. Mandela's fame grew significantly during his 27 years in prison, serving as a beacon for the anti-apartheid movement around the globe. His release in 1990 and subsequent election as South Africa's first black president in 1994 signified a beacon of hope and rejuvenation not just for South Africans but for oppressed peoples everywhere. Despite his esteemed status, Mandela's leadership was not without its critics and controversies. Western governments, including those of the United States under President Ronald Reagan and Britain under Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, labeled the African National Congress ANC, Mandela's party, as a terrorist organization due to its armed struggle against apartheid. Mandela's choice to engage in talks with the apartheid government and later to adopt a policy of reconciliation drew criticism from some within the ANC and radical groups, who felt he had given too much in exchange for too little. 
Critics also noted that Mandela's presidency, though symbolic and inspirational, faced significant obstacles in tackling urgent issues like HIV, AIDS and poverty. His strategy, which balanced practicality with idealism, often led to divided opinions, with some criticizing him for not pushing for more radical economic reforms. Nonetheless, Mandela's legacy continues to be a complex mix of accomplishments and challenges. His leadership style, marked by intelligence, strategic thinking, and a commitment to dialogue and inclusivity, has left a lasting impact on South Africa and the world. His ability to overcome personal hardships and political challenges to promote reconciliation and nation-building stands as a testament to his enduring legacy as a global icon of peace and justice. Orders, Decorations, Monuments, and Honors Throughout his life, Nelson Mandela was celebrated with an exceptional collection of over 250 awards, honors, and recognitions for his significant contributions to politics. His most distinguished awards included the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in ending apartheid and promoting peace in South Africa. Mandela also received the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Lenin Peace Prize from the Soviet Union, highlighting his international reputation as a beacon of peace and justice. Beyond these distinguished honors, Mandela was also recognized with the Al Gaddafi International Prize for Human Rights from Libya, the Bharat Ratna from India, and Nishini Pakistan from Pakistan. He was awarded the Ataturk Peace Award by Turkey, which he initially declined due to concerns over human rights in the country but later accepted in 1999. Mandela was also made a member of the Order of Isabella the Catholic and the Order of Canada, becoming the first living person to be honored with honorary Canadian citizenship. Queen Elizabeth II awarded him the titles of Bailiff Grand Cross of the Order of St. John and a member of the Order of Merit. In South Africa, Mandela was given the freedom of the city of Johannesburg in 2004, and in 2008, a statue was erected at his release from prison, representing his path from imprisonment to presidency. Another notable statue was unveiled at Pretoria's Union Buildings in 2013, to honor his role in the country's efforts towards reconciliation. On July 18, Nelson Mandela's birthday, the United Nations declared it Mandela Day in November 2009. This day encourages people around the world to spend 67 minutes volunteering, symbolizing Mandela's 67 years of commitment to the fight against apartheid. The United Nations also paid tribute to Mandela by renaming the amended standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners as the Mandela Rules in 2015, in recognition of his advocacy for the humane treatment of prisoners. In acknowledgement of his lasting legacy, the United Nations designated the years 2019 to 2028 as the Nelson Mandela Decade of Peace, highlighting his continued influence on global initiatives for peace and reconciliation. Biographies and Popular Media The initial biography of Nelson Mandela was based on interviews with Mary Benson in the 1960s, providing insights into his early years and involvement in activism. Later, two official biographies were written by his close friends. Fatima Mir's Higher Than Hope highlighted Mandela's family background, deeply influenced by Winnie Mandela. Anthony Sampson's Mandela, published in 1999, offered a detailed look at his political career and personal experiences. Other significant biographies include Martin Meredith's Mandela, first released in 1997, and Tom Lodge's Mandela, published in 2006. From the late 1980s, Mandela's image became widespread across various forms of media, appearing on a broad range of items such as photographs, artworks, statues, and even common items like t-shirts and refrigerator magnets, often labeled as Mandela Kitsch. Throughout the 1980s, he was also the subject of several impactful songs, including the specials Free Nelson Mandela, Hugh Masekela's Bring Him Back Home, Nelson Mandela, and Johnny Clegg's Asimbananga, Mandela which helped raise global awareness of his situation while in prison. Mandela's life story has been depicted in many films. Movies like the 2013 feature, Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom, the 2017 miniseries, Madiba, and the 1996 documentary, Mandela, span his entire adult life, from his youth to his presidency. Other films, such as the 2009 movie, Invictus, and the 2010 documentary, The Sixteenth Man, focus on specific moments or themes in his life. 
Lukiel suggests that films like Invictus have played a crucial role in shaping Mandela's worldwide image, particularly through the perspective of American cinema. Great job, everyone, for taking the time to watch this video. We're sure it was both educational and captivating. Please remember to leave your comments before the clock runs out. Your input is incredibly valuable to us. If you're just joining us, don't forget to subscribe to our channel by clicking the bell icon to ensure you never miss any of our updates. And if you liked what you saw, please let us know by giving it a thumbs up. It truly aids us in reaching a wider audience like you. Spread the word among your friends and family to help spread awareness and initiate important discussions. Together, we can create a change. Thanks again for your attention. Be on the lookout for more exciting content right here soon.